Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Walton. I'm from the KW Chamber of Commerce. I'm here with David Tubbs from Mere Social, who's presenting Social Media 101, the who, what, where, and why. Thank you for coming in today, David. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. This is Dave Tubbs. Um, so with Social Media 101, we're going to be talking about a lot of high-level issues and strategies to start with. And if you have any questions throughout, as we already have a question that popped up, uh, I will address them as we go. And yes, the uh, materials can be for the webinar will be sent out to all those who attend. So let's just start and go. So the first thing you should always think about before even trying to figure out how, what angle you're going to use with social media is you have to figure out the why. You have to figure out why you're even going to be part of the social media conversation. Once you actually reflect on what you want to use it for, whether it be brand awareness or growing your network or to just create more conversions for your business, because we all want to grow our businesses in one way, shape, or form. And social media is just one of the newest tools to actually go out and reach that audience. But you have to figure out the why. And by figuring out your why, it'll enable you to set a, a certain amount of goals that can actually create value. So once you have your goals, whether it be uh, finite goals such as number of followers or you want to convert 10 new businesses, pieces of business out of social media, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, those are the tangible goals that you're going to figure out from your why. And once you actually figure out your goals, then you need to start picking which type of social networks you want to start leveraging. And they're all a little different. They're all not the same. They all have their own little type of personality. But I will say, the number one question I ever receive from people when I sit down with them for the first time is, oh, oh, but do I need to be on Facebook? No, you do not have to be on Facebook if you don't want to. It's obviously the largest of all the social networks out there. It helped really create the boom behind social media with 1.1 billion users, but you don't have to be on it. It's, it's a very powerful tool. There are a lot of businesses that do create a lot of value. But say if you're a business-to-business -business focus, then you don't need to. If you're B2C, then it's always a good option. Uh, so Facebook, you're going to be looking at uh, creating a lot of visual interactions with, with your uh, followers. With Twitter, you're going to want to actually create more conversations, more engagement, because that is the most important part about social media. It's a two-way conversation. It breaks down any of the paradigm that was created with radio, with print advertising, with television. They're, they're all great advertising mediums, but they're push and pray marketing. You're pushing out information and content, and you're hoping that people will actually respond back to you, which this is what Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Pinterest do the, as the main social networks at your disposal. And Twitter does it in an instantaneous way. It has about 250 million users, which is a very, very strong number. And, a lot, and Canada has been one of the strongest adopters per population. So there's a surprising number of people, specifically in Kitchener-Waterloo and southwestern Ontario, who are on Twitter, who are having conversations every day. You don't Again, have to be active on it on a personal level, but if your brand wants to have more exposure, it's one of the few social networks that I would say every single person who's in business needs to seriously take a look at being part of the conversation on. Now, LinkedIn is an interesting social network as it's the only professional focused social network. And it, again, it just crossed the 250 million user mark last month, but my problem with it is most people who are on it, which a lot of people who are probably on this webinar are already on it, they treat it more like a collection of baseball cards. So you collect a lot of contacts. I've seen CEOs and, and VPs for companies who have 17, 1,800 followers, but then they just sit there and look at them. They don't engage. They don't try and pull any t sort of business or connection out of it. There's, it's one of the most powerful social networks, and in my opinion, in a lot of ways, it's more powerful than Facebook. And 
that's being lost on so many people for recruitment. It's 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 not being used to its strength for your average small to medium sized business. It's not being used in actually connecting with people. I the again with something with LinkedIn, if you're sending requests for connections with the template ask of I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn, please, please, if you take one thing out of this webinar, please just stop doing that. Put in a custom message. Let people know why you want to connect, whether it be for any reason. If you want to get to know them more or they're just you think they're interesting, go and let them know that inside the message. It it make you memorable and it'll actually create more conversation to work off of. And that's the problem that a lot of people who use LinkedIn have. They add these connections, they look on their feed once in a while, and then they just leave it. That's all they do. And it is a little disheartening when it's such a powerful tool. And the next one we're going to talk about is YouTube. YouTube, everybody knows YouTube. Most people have looked at a video today on YouTube. And it's not traditionally what you would call a social network, but it's one of the most powerful content distributors that you can have. If you're a very visual medium, so if you're a realtor or even if you're wanting to do more profiles on your company to let to break down barriers and let the consumer out there know who you are, YouTube is a great avenue to interview a CEO or just take a small video of something you're doing around the office. Social media breaks down barriers and what that does is it allows you to actually get to know the people out there and let the other people know who you are in a very personal way because that will allow you to build trust. And one of the biggest things people want now is they want to trust and believe in the people who, are, who they're doing business with on a regular basis. And I just got a comment just asking um, not being able to personalized requests when you're adding people to your network. And there are a few issues with LinkedIn because there are so many ways to actually send out a request. And when you're looking through, say, your connections on your home on your home screen, you go to the top and you go to the drop down menu and you get a whole list of people that you that it suggests you should connect with. This sometimes doesn't allow you to connect. So never actually, it'll usually prompt you asking you, do you want to send the, front, the, the connection request? In, unless it allows you to edit that, don't send it yet. It is easy, but the one thing um, it will limit you on is if you have no connection to this person whatsoever, you're not a friend, you're not a colleague, uh, you just you know who they are and you want to get to know them, there are limitations because they want to stop spamming. Spamming is a very constant problem in all social networks, whether we like it or not. And that's one of the issues that we're having. And another LinkedIn question uh, and about premium versions of LinkedIn. And again, if you're part of LinkedIn, a lot of the times you've probably been given e sent emails about you know trying one free month of premium access for LinkedIn. It is very valuable. It is, but at the same time, it's very expensive. And unless you're on LinkedIn all the time, there is value there. Uh, I wouldn't start with the highest premium one, which I think is like $92 a month now. But if you're in recruiting, if business development is a huge focus in your department, then I would suggest trying it. it I think it's only about $40 now a month. And you can try it for a month or two. If you don't like it, then you can just... Uh, you can get out of the uh, commitment that you've made. But it is if business development is something you really, really want to use it for, then the premium account on LinkedIn is something to look into. It's not a silver bullet. You still have to be able to personalize and target and find your second and third connections, uh, degree connections on LinkedIn to really build trust and get to know people. But it, it, it's worth exploring. I've used it for one month, and I, I did find it interesting just to see the different connections that I have out there that are second or third degree, and it helps you target better. And a lot of people can get a lot of value out of the free version of LinkedIn by just going to the search function when you're trying to find people. So if you're trying to connect with someone in a certain industry or a certain company, 
it's the best way to actually get to know who those people are and what how many degrees are between you and that person. And it does take time. The prospect, if you're trying to get in contact with a third degree contact, the prospecting process is a little more intense, but you also have to think that these type of connections wouldn't have happened without LinkedIn anyway, so it's worth the effort to put in, connect, and be upfront with people on why you want to get to know them. But at the same time, don't be pushy, don't be salesy. It's one of the one of the balancing acts that comes with LinkedIn. So I hope I answered that question for you. And uh, just to go back to YouTube real quick, it's one of those interfaces that you don't have to be on constantly and don't always think that you have to update once a day or every couple days and try and do a video blog of some kind. You don't, but if you're working YouTube into your actual marketing process, whether it be social media or digital period on your website, make sure you're consistent with it. If you if you're trying to get more content out there on a regular basis, then sure, try and do one video a week or one video a month and then make that known so it gives people a reason to keep coming back. And the last one I'm going to briefly talk about is the main social networks uh, is Pinterest. If you don't know what Pinterest is, it's been around for about two years now and imagine it's a giant cork board and you pin pictures or interesting quotes to uh, a company cork board. But this is then shared with millions of people out there. It's around 80 million users now which is obviously when you're looking at the numbers on the screen, it pales in comparison, but the activity that's being created is very, very intense because it is almost 100% visual based, picture based, and now they've integrated video, which is a little easier. And they've also started catering to businesses and professionals because they know that, well, one day they have to actually monetize it. And it's, one of the interfaces that I would suggest just dabbling in, you don't have to do everything. You don't even have to do two social networks at a time when you're building out your plan because you don't want to do too much. But they all have their own little personalities. Uh, they're either going to be visual or non-visual in nature, as in this next slide. So that's how I would start separating what you want to use social media for. Do you want to use it for connections? Do you want to use it to build relationships? And what do you have at your disposal to take advantage of them? So if you're looking, if you're in a very visual industry, so if you're in real estate or if you own a flower shop or you're just, you're outside all the time, then visual social medias are great. So Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and I've also included Instagram here. And Instagram is one of the social networks that, again, is not necessarily a social network, but it's owned by Facebook now, and it's starting to create more integration. And it also edges at a core demographic. They all are a little different. as I, They all have their own personalities. So Instagram has a very uh, Generation Y, millennial angle on it. So if you're looking at getting at the uh, 18 to 35-year range, Instagram is something to start dipping your toes in. It's a little bit between, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's as a social network, it's a little bit between Pinterest and Twitter. You can add messages, tag people, and push it out on various social networks at the exact same time. And I, I will touch on Pinterest briefly as well when it comes to demographics in that it's still very, very, very heavily women. There, it was a joke for a long time when it first came out saying that this is where women go to plan weddings and uh, and find recipes. That couldn't be farther from the truth. It's just it's still now heavily 80% women, which is very, very drastic shift from a lot of the other social networks which go right down the center, except for Google+, Plus, which I don't have here because it skews more male as well. And just got a quick uh, question from uh, one of the attendees asking about Twitter being more visual now. And it's I wouldn't say it's a drastic change. Twitter has been moving more and more visual, but at the same time, the majority of all communication that's happening on 
Twitter is going to be text-based. It's going to be tagging people, building relationships through that respect, and visual is just a great addition that they're making. With the IPO and the leading up to try and diversify itself by making it more visual, it, you will see it trying to integrate more video, more pictures, and then try and pull in more advertisers that way because they know that a lot of people share content that is visual, not necessarily text-based. And it, it's a great point to be made, but it will be more visual, but not right now. It's still built on conversations, not on a visual aspect itself. So, for example, Facebook, the vast majority of successful posts that are out there have a picture attached to it, whether it be a link that in integrates a picture or you posting a picture on whatever it is and asking a question about it to try and draw out that, those types of uh, engagement from people. And the same thing with YouTube. It's all about engagement and trying to get comments and shares. It's not necessarily about views. It's about trying to pull out engagement so then you're memorable to, that, to those people and you get to know who they are. Where Twitter you're getting to know who they are just by the conversation themselves, and that's what it was created as. Facebook was created as a way to add friends and find out what they're doing, and then they integrated video and pictures so people can share and build and say it on the website longer by just clicking through the pictures. And Twitter's a little differently different because it was built on just being so slim, easy to use, and not that complicated, which is still one of its biggest advantages. And of course, uh, just to touch on this last, uh, lastly, is LinkedIn. It's still very, very uh, text-based, but it's if you've looked at LinkedIn in the last six months, it has started to integrate itself to look more like Facebook. It's trying to push more uh, photo integration, but it's still trying to stress interaction. If you go on any page now when you log into LinkedIn, it usually asks you, do you want to tell somebody that they, you want to endorse somebody or recommend somebody that you're already connected with. This is a way they're just trying to draw out engagement, but it's not visual in any nature. So these are the type of personalities that you need to consider when you're trying to pick your social networks. And I can't stress enough that you don't have to do a ton. If you, it's much better to do one very, very well, then try and do three or four that just kind of peter out and you're not doing that that well. So if you ever come across a consultant or someone who is helping you, telling you that you have to be on a social net, like a specific social network, ask them follow-up questions. Try and figure out why. So I hope I also asked, answered the question on uh, Twitter as uh, to your liking. If not, just let me know. So... And I've already touched on you don't want to do too much. You don't want to try and get in and actually figure out how to use four social networks at any time. Anytime I'm ever in a, in a coaching situation with a new client, it's always about trying to figure out what works in with their schedule. You have to make time. You have to learn how to, how to use it. But doing too much hurts you much, much more because it shows that you might not care about that audience as much as you should. And this goes for whether you're doing it yourself or for your organization. If it's a personal account, you can be a little more laxed with it. Your LinkedIn should still be updated every couple months. So for example, if any of you out there haven't updated a line on your LinkedIn profile in the past three months, go in, take a look at it, update something, It'll push you into other, your other connections, news feeds, and make sure that it's relevant. So if you want to add another skill that you've learned, so say you took a recent course, pop in and do that. It takes two seconds, but you want to make sure it works into your schedule so you do it on a regular basis. So I actually schedule 45 minutes of social media time in the morning and 45 at, towards the end of my workday, and then if something like, Twitter that needs instantaneous response, I'll make time throughout the day for that, but it has to work into my schedule because I have other things to do, just like all of everybody else, and it's trying to make it work for your time that you already have. You can't destroy your calendar by constantly 
updating Twitter every five minutes or trying to create a new Facebook post on a regular basis. You have to be able to schedule it in, plan, and execute it well. And it doesn't matter if it's for your personal or your organizational accounts, it has to be regimented to start with until it becomes more natural. And the more it becomes natural, the easier it will become. And I, I have to be honest, the, the more fun you'll have. Every single day when I get to work, I'm having a great day because I jump on Twitter for the first 10 minutes and I get to see what people are talking about. I get to see what's interesting out there and I get to connect with people who I would have never connected with at all without these social networks and it's just plain fun. So if you're having a great time at a networking event in person, it's the exact same feeling you have but on a regular basis online. So, and I'll address something that's not on the slide but a lot of people think that social media is not personal. It can alienate conversations, but it's, I've created so many great conversations, friendships, acquaintances that, again, I would have never had the chance to create if it weren't for social media, specifically Twitter. I, I've had so many great coffee meetings, so many good uh, leads created out of something that I enjoy doing it at the exact same time and I can't, once you build that strength of knowledge and confidence, it will come. You'll have what uh, uh, an ex-colleague of mine says uh, is a twaha moment. So when you really, really enjoy what you're doing, you'll get this light bulb in your head saying like, wow, I get it now. This is great. This is fun. And I trust me, it will happen. So let me know if you have any more questions in the meantime. Now, when you're actually trying to set goals, your goals will fall under three categories, but they're not necessarily limited to this. They're based upon follower numbers or view numbers and engagement levels and monetary conversions. The, num the first category, I will warn you, is a bit of a vanity metric. So, for example, if someone has 3,000 Twitter followers, I don't really care that they have 3,000 Twitter followers. I don't care that they have 10,000 Facebook likes. It's what they're doing with the numbers, which is the engagement level. So are people retweeting? Are they mentioning you? Are they actually pushing your name out to other people on a regular basis? Are you posting content that creates that engagement? And then finally is the monetary conversions, which comes to deals that are created, connections that are made that would have never been connected otherwise. So if you're, I, you should try and set follower number goals, but don't make that the be all and end all. I would much rather have 200 very dedicated followers on Twitter than 2,000 disengaged followers that couldn't care less, but they're just there following me. And there have been a number of studies that have happened lately where people are buying Twitter followers. Uh, techvibes.com actually did a little test on how much it would cost and how long it would take for someone to buy 80,000 Twitter followers. It took the reporter something like two weeks and about $40 to buy these followers. And they're there, they're numbers, they're, they're not taken out and they, some, sometimes they were actually real people. but it's still a number. It didn't create engagement. It didn't increase any of his click-throughs on links or anything like that, but it was just a number. So make it a goal, but not the be-all and end-all. And as I mentioned, engagement levels are anything from uh, Facebook post likes, shares, comments, and Facebook tweets, retweets, uh, mentions, click-throughs on links, which there are a number of different softwares out there now that allow you to track that information, such as uh, hoopsuite.com. And when it comes to monetary conversions, this comes down to your own tracking. You can set up systems within your website through Google Analytics to track if someone comes to page A and then goes to page B, then that's a monetary conversion. They're calling me on the phone at step B or you can actually do a physical tracking. I've met a number of people who every single phone call they have that comes in, they track, they ask, how did you hear about us? And they're actually starting to see more 
digital communication leads than from traditional avenues such as yellow pages or um, or print advertising but that's just their example and it, it, it just takes time that's all but it takes you to actually make that tracking effort and make short-term and long-term goals so set three month and 12 month goals your short-term goals should be changing on a regular basis you should go back and evaluate the numbers and the engagement that you're having on a regular basis so then you can actually improve on it you you don't want to set one long-term goal 12 months in advance and come to the one-year mark and realize oh I guess I didn't really get to my number but I don't know why and then you have to go back months and months and months and see where you could have improved you want to sit set short goals and a long-term goal and then constantly upgrade and tweak because social networks change people's habits change but you can still track what people are doing through a number of different analytics tools that are out there and as you reevaluate your goals at regularly your plan and your strategy that you create will also alter itself based upon your needs so your business needs will change so maybe you need a different type of client so you on LinkedIn you're gonna target different people or on Facebook you're gonna be maybe doing more actual Facebook advertising which is another great avenue so you maybe move away more from page posts to advertising itself so it's really up to you to figure out what your regular uh, evaluations move to. So once your goals haven't been met or they have been successful, make the tweaks that you need to actually move forward and be very successful. And I've mentioned a few tools such as uh, tracking tools like Hootsuite, um, but one of the most underrated forms of uh, social media tools is your phone. I, I constantly am tweeting on my on my uh, Blackberries at 10. I'm constantly using Hootsuite to track my link clicks and everything like that because it allows me to show some type of ROI. Return on investment is always going to be talked about whether uh, someone likes it or not. People want to be able to show value from the time spent putting the effort in and creating engagement and that's done through tracking link clicks, retweets and Hootsuite and another uh, platform called Sprout Social does this very, very well. By utilizing these tools, which are very cost effective, specifically Hootsuite, I suggest uh, for any, anybody who's going to use Twitter at, for business purposes should get a Hootsuite account. It's free to use, but you can pay $10 a month for a more advanced uh, version, which will allow you to create more reports on a, a number of different uh, metrics systems that you can create you can do custom reports and uh, on a regular basis so you can show value to your boss or yourself and that's very important to a very skeptical leadership team that might not see a value in social media but then you can show them no this post reached this many people this many people engaged and this is how we're able to capitalize on it in the future and without that, you're going to be always in a constant battle with people who might not see the value in social media. And one of the biggest arguments that I would suggest making if you're in that situation with a superior or even a client of any kind, if you're helping them with social media, is they'll ask you what the value is of being on Twitter. I try and ask, well, what is the value of an untracked print advertisement? In advertisement in the newspaper and a magazine. I'm not knocking those advertising mediums at all. It's just if you as the ad creator don't create triggers inside that ad, you're never going to be able to track how effective it was. So if you're doing advertising in print, you'll usually put a special phone number in so you can track that, which is great. And with digital advertising or marketing of any kind, there are so many analytics now at your disposal you just have to take them, analyze them properly, and then you have your ROI or at least something to show others. And that's been the big push in a lot of the tools that have been created, specifically Sprout Social, which is a very widely used high-end uh, social media dashboard and tracking tool. So anybody have any 
uh, questions at this point, whether it be about tools or plans or strategies. All right. So we've just got a couple more slides to go, but this one is probably the most important. These are my three Bs of social media. If you do anything when it, when it comes to posting or strategizing, these are the three rules you should be trying to stick to. You should be consistent, which means you should be posting on a regular basis, and you should also be consistent with who you are. You don't want to be, uh, you want to be authentic at all times. You want to be who you are online as you would be offline, because it's never more depressing to meet somebody on Twitter or LinkedIn who acts really, really engaged and cares about you online, and then you go in for an actual meeting to get a deal signed, and they, are, they couldn't be more disengaged. They're constantly on their phone looking at you, not really caring about who you are. That's the type of consistent authenticity that, that's always going to be needed. There's always going to have to be a face behind any type of digital logo. So, for example, on uh, the Chamber Twitter account, there's always somebody listed as who you're going to actually be talking to. And this is important because people want to know that they're not talking to machines or a third party. They want to know that they're talking to that company, that organization, or even that person because a lot of times uh, politicians or CEOs, they, they kind of farm out their social media or the bulk of it to someone else to do. They make it up front, but it's not as authentic otherwise. And the second B is be informative. Find great information that people want to know about, want to engage with. Because most people are going to be on Facebook and Twitter to find out what's going on. They're not going to be on there to just talk about nothing. They, they, they want something out of you. And a lot of it now is free information, interesting things to talk about. So I've seen uh, interior decorators. They will post one picture on the left, one picture on the right. And they're both great looking kitchens. But then they'll ask, what, what do you like most about each of them? And it's a little way to engage and be informative at the same time because it creates discussion and it's something great to look at. And then the last one is be positive. You have to be as positive and happy as you can. If you see somebody on Facebook or Twitter who's always really down or all their posts are very negative about everything, you're not going to want to talk to them. Just as if you are at a real life networking event and you see some guy in a group who's yelling about you know what's going on in the government or can't believe that uh, this this client is being so uh, ridiculous you're not going to go over there and talk to them because they'll push you away it's the same thing with any type of online social media use you want to be positive you want to be happy you want to act like you always have a smile on your face and you will. It, you don't have, you, that's not going to be inconsistent. You will be positive because, again, it's a great medium. Uh, you might be frustrated at times but with, with whatever's going on, but you don't necessarily have to buy into that negativity. And we just have a question. Uh, should nonprofit organizations go about social media similarly? Should they do anything different? Now, this is a great point. Um, when it comes to nonprofit organizations, my first suggestion would be it will be very similar to any type of for-profit organization, but you have an advantageous way to go about it, which would be harness any volunteers, any committee members that you have, and help spread your message that way to start. There's really no strong differentiation between nonprofit and for-profit because you're both trying to share and communicate with other people. This is a little different because you'd still have to figure out what your goals are. Are your goals to bring more people to an event or bring more awareness? You'll have to rank them and then your, your strategy will shape that type of social media activity. And I, again, I can't stress it's not going to be too different, but you're going to want to push more engagement probably than a, a business would on a regular basis. And you don't necessarily uh, have to fall into any sort of social media advertising. It, it, it's, it's a great avenue to take. Facebook has Facebook ads are one of the most comprehensive and innovative ways to advertise ever created, but you don't necessarily have to utilize that. 
So from a nonprofit perspective and in my own experience, it's not drastically different, but you actually you're in a more advantageous situation because you can start talking with an existing audience or what uh, a thought leader Seth Godin calls a tribe. You have a tribe of people who already care about what you're doing and you can harness those people, whether you're on Facebook or Twitter, and start engaging in, and utilizing that passion to help you. So thanks for listening and watching. If you have any more questions, uh, we'll wait a couple minutes and you can let me know if you have any or not. And if you have any questions otherwise moving forward, you can email me, you can tweet at me, you can do whatever you want. And you can hop on your social if you want if you have any big questions and watch some tutorials on from start to, from basics to advanced if you want as well. So. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Hope everyone enjoyed the presentation.